Thank you very much. Uh, th thank you to so many, uh, both old friends and new friends. Um, I have to say, uh, although we've done quite a lot of work on nutrition, the truth of the matter is that I grew up in Fargo, North Dakota, and my grandfather was a cattle rancher, and his father was a cattle rancher, and so was his father. And my own father grew up in the cattle business, but he, he didn't care for it. So he left and went to medical school, and he spent his life treating diabetes in Fargo, North Dakota, which is where we grew up. And we still ate very much as if we were in the cattle business, which is to say this was our everyday fare. These were the things that we ate all the time. And pretty much every day of my life it was roast beef, baked potatoes, and corn, except for special occasions when it was roast beef, baked potatoes, and peas. And uh, that's about as much as I knew. And if you look at what has happened, last year I wrote an article in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition where I tracked the changes in the American diet since the Department of Agriculture started tracking what we eat in 1909. And back in 1909, the average American consumed in a year's time 123.9 pounds of meat. Well, what's happened since that time? It's gone up, slowly but surely it's gone up, and we're over 200 pounds per person per year. Where are we putting 75 pounds extra meat every person, every single year? And, and by the way, that increase is not mainly in beef. Any ideas what it is? It's a big increase in chicken. Americans today eat more than a million chickens per hour. It's more than nine billion per year. And we have the idea that it must be, must be healthy, it must be lower in fat. The difference is not very great, and we are in the worst shape that we have ever been in as a culture. Now let me say a special word of condemnation for cheese. Back 100 years ago, Americans ate less than four pounds of cheese in a year. It just wasn't our thing. But right around 1960, what happened? Well, fast food chains arrived. And they had sandwiches that always go a little bit better with some cheese, and then, Pizza. Pizza came in, and you can connect your pizza restaurant to your house with a telephone wire, and you'll have dinner in 30 minutes. And kids will eat it, and busy parents can pick up a pizza on the way home, and it's a great way to deliver cheese into your esophagus. Unfortunately, that cheese is 70% fat. 7-0. 70% fat. And it's not good fat. It's, are you familiar with saturated fat? Saturated fat. When I was a kid growing up, we used to go down to the kitchen. There, my, mother had, my parents had five kids. My mother would be cooking bacon. And she would take the bacon out with a fork from the fry pan and set it on a paper towel to, to drain. And that hot bacon grease that was left in the pan, she would carefully pour that into a jar to save it. And she knew she didn't even have to put it in the refrigerator. She could just put it on the shelf, because what happens to bacon grease as it cools? It turns into a waxy solid, and so it's never going to go rancid. She just put it on the shelf, and the next day she would spoon it back into the fry pan and fry eggs in it. It's amazing that any of her children lived to adulthood, as I reflect on it now, <laughs> but that's the way we ate. Anyway, that solid cheese, uh, solid fat that you see in, in bacon grease, but also is in cheese, that's saturated fat. That's the kind that raises your cholesterol. It increases the risk of heart attacks. It increases the risk of breast cancer. It increases the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Cheese is 70% fat. Most of the fat in it is saturated fat. If it were any worse, it would be Vaseline. And yet we feed it to children every single day. When cheese prices fall, the government buys it, puts it into schools. Um, let me say a word about sugar. The blue line is cane sugar and beet sugar. And as you can see, it's falling. But we are more than making up for it with what? High fructose corn syrup. That's the green line. You put it all together, you get that red line, total sugar, and that's increasing. So what has happened over the last century? We're eating 75 pounds more meat every person every year, 30 pounds more cheese, 40 or 50 pounds more sugar. Why do we have an obesity epidemic in the United States? I don't know. You know, we say to children, we say to our children, 
the reason there's so much childhood obesity is you're just playing too many video games, you're watching too much TV, and you should really go outside and exercise. Now that's half true. It's really good for kids to get exercise and to get away from other things. But to exercise off the calories in six chicken nuggets, a child would need to run three and a half miles. And if the child had a soda with it, that's another two and a half miles. And if there were an order of french fries as part of it, that's two miles more. So in theory, a child could exercise off the calories we are putting into their lives. But that's not the issue. And that's not the reason kids are heavy. It's because they eat like their parents, and the parents have the worst diets we have ever had in the history of this planet. And we have to get, deal with things on the input side of the equ equation, not try to focus on burning it all off later. What has happened to diabetes? Um, as you can see, there's North Dakota where I grew up. And back in 1994, diabetes was less than 4% of people in North Dakota, more than 6% of people in Louisiana and Mississippi. But what happened? As our diets changed, something's happened to this map. This is 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004, 2005. In 2006, we needed new colors for some political reason. I'm not sure what that's about. But the map continues to change. So from one year to the next, you don't really see a lot of change in what we're eating. But if you just step back a little bit, it's changing dramatically. And diabetes isn't completely... Uh, this is completely new territory. Now, researchers have said, well, who does better? Who's healthier? And researchers have been very keen on studying Seventh-day Adventists because, as you know, the idea is that we're not going to have tobacco, alcohol, caffeine, or meat. Almost all Adventists are very good at the first three of those, but many are not so good with the fourth, the fourth one. And so that sets up a natural experiment. And researchers in 2009 published this finding in Diabetes Care, the American Diabetes Association's Journal for Doctors. And they split a group of 61,000 Adventists into five groups. Over here on the left, we have non-vegetarians, meaning they were eating meat, dairy products, eggs, whatever they wanted to. And what we're tracking is their body mass index. Are you familiar with BMI? BMI, body mass index, is your weight but it's adjusted for your height. And so a healthy body mass index is below 25. And as you can see, the non-vegetarians were a little bit over 25. Well, what about this group, the semi-vegetarians? They ate meat no more than once a week. And they were a little bit thinner. And then pesco-vegetarians, what's that? Fish, okay. So they didn't eat any meat at all except for fish. And they're a little thinner. And then lacto-ovo vegetarians, lacto for milk, ovo for, for eggs, they would have eggs and milk, but no other animal products, no meat at all. And they're thinner. And then what's this group? Vegan. A vegan is not a person from the planet Vegas. <laughs> a vegan diet means no animal products at all. And that's actually the only group that's smack in the middle of the healthy diet range. Now, there's a reason that the American Diabetes Association published these figures. It wasn't because of this, it was because of this. If you look at diabetes prevalence, it's exactly the same gradient, just much more severe. The meat eaters have a lot of it, the vegans have almost none of it. And so if you look backward, what if I'm eating vegetables and fruits and whole grains and beans? I'm eating a vegan diet and I decide, you know what, I think I want to add an egg in the morning and maybe some milk later in the day. Well, my weight goes up and my diabetes risk inches up. Let's have some fish along with that. Well, my weight goes up a little more. My diabetes risk takes another jump. How about the occasional red meat? We get a little bit worse. How about meat every day? Then that puts us at the top risk for both. Are you with me? Is this making sense? OK. So you don't have to be Adventist. You could be European. And you would have exactly the same thing. This is men. This is women. And what we see is the meat eaters are the heaviest, the vegans are the thinnest, and the other groups just slot in. So my research team said, all right, what if we introduce a plant-based diet to people who had never tried such a thing and never thought about trying such a thing in their life? We brought in 64 women. They were all overweight. And their goal was to see if they could trim down a bit. And they were all after the age of menopause. They'd been on every kind of diet you can imagine. 
They had been on Atkins and South Beach and Jenny Craig and Weight Watchers, and they had been frustrated that it wasn't really working for them. So what we asked them to do was to eat off what I'm going to call the power plate, which is a diagram that we developed some years ago to say that the healthy ingredients for a meal are the fruits and grains and legumes. What are legumes? Beans, beans, peas, lentils, things that grow in a pod and vegetables. So those are the four healthy food groups. And so we said, all right, there are two rules in this study. The first is it'll be vegan, meaning we're not going to have any animal products during the study, but you can have all the fruits and vegetables and legumes and grains that you want. We're also going to keep it low in oil overall, low in fat. The reason for that is that some people might avoid animal fats, but they take that bottle of olive oil and they go glug, 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 all over their salad, all over their pasta, and they're getting a lot of fat. Well, why is that a problem? This is going to be on the test. If I take a thimble and I pour oil into it, um, by the, before it gets about half full, I've got a gram of fat. And every gram of fat has nine calories. Every gram of beef fat, chicken fat, olive oil, any kind of fat has nine calories. Fat really condenses calories in a very small space. The reason for that is if a chicken eats too much, the chicken needs a place to keep those calories, and fat is nature's way of doing that. If a cow eats too much, the cow doesn't make cow bread, they make cow fat. If a chicken eats too much, it becomes chicken fat. So vegetable oils and animal fats are extremely dense in calories, nine calories per gram. But carbohydrates, bread, potatoes, rice, have only four calories per gram. And so all the people who say, gee, I, I don't want to get heavy, I'm going to avoid carbs, they're avoiding the low-calorie foods, and they're eating the high-calorie foods. I want to make sure everyone's with me. How many calories are there in a gram of beef fat? Nine? Okay, we all agree? Good. How many calories are there in a gram of chicken fat? Nine. How about if it's peanut oil? Nine. How about fish oil? How about olive oil? How about extra virgin olive oil? How about extra, extra virgin olive oil and this bottle cost me $30? How about 1040 motor oil? Okay, don't try this at home, but if you could cook with it, it actually has nine calories per, per gram, okay? So, two rules. Avoid the animal products, keep the oils very low. Those are the only rules. We ask people not to change their exercise patterns, not to do anything else. And a typical day's meals might be something like blueberry pancakes or oatmeal with cinnamon and raisins or topped with bananas or something. And for lunch, if you wanted chili, fine. But it would not be a meat chili. It would be a bean chili or chunky vegetable chili. Fruit was unlimited. If we went Italian uh, for, for dinner, maybe you might start with a nice salad. You could have the lentil soup or minestrone. You could top your spaghetti with artichoke hearts and seared oyster mushrooms or a marinara sauce, whatever you wanted. There were no calorie limits, no portion limits, no exercise. And every week, everybody came into our research center for a discussion group, which is a terrific way to help people to stay on track. We bring everybody in once a week and we talk. And we share our challenges, we share our successes. And the third week of this study, I have to tell you, one of the women said, Dr. Barnard, I found a treat that I can have on your low-fat vegan diet. And I thought, uh-oh, I wonder what this is. She opened her purse and she pulled out a bag of Twizzlers. Have you seen these things? They sell them at the 7-Eleven. It's red licorice, uh, these little pencil-shaped twisty things. She said, read the label. And I did. And you know what? It's true. There are no animal products in them. There is no added oil. It's just sugary, starchy, artificially colored junk, and she made sure that all the other research participants knew they could eat all the Twizzlers they wanted to in Dr. Barnard's research study. But the thing is, when you do a research study, you set your rules and you have to live with them. And luckily, my vegan, low-fat, Twizzler-fueled participants who went off on their path to the unknown, as we tracked them over time, in 14 weeks, your average person lost 13 pounds. Okay, not so bad. They sustained their weight loss. We, we tracked them a year later. They were still thinner. We tracked them two years later. They were thinner than at one year. In other words, unlike every other diet they'd been on, which what happens when you're on a diet? You lose weight. Then it starts to stall. Then it starts coming back. 
and then you often end up heavier than you were before, so you go on another diet, you lose weight, it stalls, weight comes back, we're ratcheting up our weight with this yo-yo effect, but finally, they discovered that by not restricting calories, by eating as much as they wanted of entirely healthy food, the weight problem took care of itself. Uh, they, their weight, their uh, waistline got slimmer. They had an increased cal after meal calorie burn. I'm going to explain that to you in a minute what that is. But let me first put a human face on this. This is Nancy. Nancy had a weight problem. She also had type 2 diabetes. And she came in and we showed her how to eat this way. She lost 40 pounds over about a year's time. She stopped all of her diabetes medicines and she was in better control than she was on, on the medicine. But one day she came in to tell me what had happened to her. She was home cooking spaghetti, and as the noodles were cooking on the stove, she got a jar of spaghetti sauce off the shelf, and she opened it up and poured it into a saucepan to heat it up. And she just stopped. She set down the jar, and she looked at her hands. She had rheumatoid arthritis. If any of you have rheumatoid arthritis, you know it starts at the base of your thumbs, and then it spreads to the other joints, and you soon learn that whoever is making those vacuum-packed jars, they are sadists, because you can't open them. Well, she realized her pain had gone away. When did it go away? Well, it must have gone away around the time she changed her diet. She came running into our center to say, this is a, a study to help me with my weight and my diabetes. Why did my joints get better? And I explained to her that I actually wrote a book in 1998 called Foods That Fight Pain because I was awestruck that simple things you, you would think have nothing to do with food, arthritis, migraine headaches, menstrual pains, lower back pain, have very strong links to food. And in her case, what was happening is she had rheumatoid arthritis. If you could go inside a joint, what you see is the joint does not look normal. It looks angry. You have an inflamed lining of the joint. And the reason it's inflamed is there are antibodies. Antibodies are proteins that your body makes, like torpedoes, to attack viruses, to attack cancer cells or bacteria. Well, for some reason, your body thought there was an enemy inside, and it started making antibodies that are now attacking your own synovial membranes of your joints. Well, what could that foreign protein be? Dairy products are the most common trigger for arthritis. But most people go their whole lives never realizing that their body's reacting to it. And she had just taken it out of her diet to help her, her weight and to help her diabetes, and her joints got better. Now, let me encourage you not to take what I am saying on faith. If you have rheumatoid arthritis, there are certain triggers. Dairy is one, eggs, meat, it could be white potatoes, it could be citrus fruits. For different people, it's different things. There are about a dozen triggers. But once you know what they are, you just take them out, let your joints get better, and if you don't believe it, put the foods back in. You can do this as many times as you need to to be convinced that it works. Now, not everyone gets better. I would say 50 to 70% of people can have a dramatic improvement in their arthritis pain or it just flat out goes away. So that was her case. Now, this is Vance. Vance was a Washington, D.C. policeman. Vance's father was dead by age 30. Vance was 31 when he was diagnosed with diabetes. He came into our study uh, in his late 30s. And we put him on this diet. He said this is easy because he didn't have to count carbohydrate grams. He didn't have to limit what he ate. He lost 60 pounds. He stopped his diabetes medication. If he went into any clinic in the United States or anywhere else, they wouldn't have diagnosed him as ever having had diabetes. You just can't find it anymore. And when I was asking his permission to tell his story, he said, well, make sure you tell everybody that my erectile dysfunction went away too. I'm going to leave that to you. Um, so you might be asking by now, how does this work? How is it that I'm not limiting calories and I'm eating carbohydrate, I'm eating all kinds of foods, but I'm still losing weight and I'm getting healthier and my diabetes is improving? Let me show you. Um, the first is a real simple thing. It's fiber. Fiber is a boring word. Don't go to sleep. Fiber is plant roughage. Um, if you eat beans or vegetables, the, the roughage that's in them is, is fiber. It has virtually no calories, but it fills you up. Fiber holds water in your stomach. So you'll think, I'm eating a lot. The truth is you're not eating all that much. Now, on the other hand, Velveeta has no fiber. It's, it's not from a plant, so it doesn't have fiber. 
meats, eggs, dairy products, never have fiber. And so every last calorie that's in an animal product, you get full advantage of it, if you, if you catch what I'm saying. But on the other hand, when you're eating plant foods, vegetables and fruits and so forth, the fiber goes in, it fills you up, and if I measure it, even though you will tell me I'm eating just as much as before, I'm eating a lot, I'm really full, when I add it up, you could be eating 200 calories a day less. Why are you losing weight? Because you're pushing away from the table a little bit earlier. I'm tricking your brain into saying I'm full without so many calories, okay? So the second thing, though, is you get an after-meal calorie burn. I want to explain this to you. When you, you might be saying, I am not burning calories as fast as I used to. When I was 12, I could eat anything. But now that I'm older, I just look at food. I start gaining weight. Well, your metabolism may be slowing down. When you wake up in the morning, your metabolism is as slow as it's going to be the whole day. And I can measure it. You lie down on an exam table, and I put a see-through canopy over your head and shoulders, and I'm measuring how much oxygen you're breathing in and how much carbon dioxide you're putting out minute by minute. And with some really simple calculations, I can tell you how fast you're burning calories. Well, it's not your imagination. Your metabolism is very slow. But as soon as I give you breakfast, you start absorbing the nutrients. They're going into your cells. Your metabolism is starting to wake up. And you're going to burn calories about, for about three hours, you're going to burn calories faster than before. Well, what we found in our research studies, when people go on a low-fat, plant-based diet, this curve changes. They burn calories about 16% faster in this after-meal period, about 16% fa faster for three hours after breakfast, three hours after lunch, three hours after dinner. So why are people losing weight on this diet? Well, part of it is they're eating a little bit less without realizing it. The other part is they're burning off more. So why are the vegans the skinniest group that you ever see? It's because their metabolism is where it ought to be. And their appetite is where it ought to be. They're in sync with their own biology. Now, you might be saying, how does that work? Um, here's something for extra credit. This is a muscle cell. And the reason I want to show you a muscle cell is because that is what's burning calories in your body. Your muscles are your big calorie burners. So if I stick a needle in my arm and I pull out one muscle cell, it's sort of spindle-shaped like that. And what is burning calories in there is that little dot and that one. Those are called mitochondria. Do you remember that from your high school biology? Mitochondria are little burners inside the cell that turn sugar or fat into energy the cell can use. And you've got a lot of them, and that's why your metabolism is revving up. But there's something else in that cell. There's fat. And little bits of fat are in the cell. Now, doctors don't like words like fat. It's only got one syllable. So we're going to call it intramyocellular lipid. Um, intra means inside, myo means muscle, cellular means cellular. Lipid means fat. Intramyocellular lipid is, is fat inside the muscle cell. Where did it come from? Well, it came from the foods that you eat. Passing into your bloodstream, going into the cells of the body with remarkably little change. And the more fat you eat, the more it builds up. Now, here's what we discover. Let's say you came into my laboratory on Monday morning. And I'm going to say, stick around here through Wednesday, and every day I want you to eat a lot of fat. I want you to eat a fatty meal every day. And so the fat starts building up inside your cell, and as that occurs, the mitochondria start switching off. Your DNA says, hooray! Fat, that's great. We've got fat that we can store. If we have a famine, maybe sometime in the next couple weeks, I'll be set because I've got this fat that I can burn up if I need it. Now, you look at your body and you say, wait a minute. You don't need to store everything that I'm eating. The truth is there's not been a famine around here for the longest time, and I really doubt there's going to be one anytime soon. In fact, I'm going to have lunch in a couple of hours. Your body is not listening. Your body was programmed a very long time ago when there were things like famines. Your body is still thrilled to have a big load of fat that it can store in your muscle cells.
to be able to store it, it is turning off the mitochondria. What I mean is that the DNA to make them gets switched off, so you end up with fewer and less active mitochondria. Are you with me? So what happens is that fat slows down your after-meal calorie burn. You just, your metabolism just isn't what it should be. So what we need to do instead is let's go on a vegan diet. How much fat is there in a vegan diet? Very little. There's no animal fat. There's only traces of vegetable oil. So the fat starts draining out very quickly and getting the fat out of your cells boosts your after-meal calorie burn. Very, very easy. Why do vegans lose weight without trying? It's really simple. Now, I would like to now show you a little bit more complex slide, but this is my most important slide because I want to show you the, t the cause of type 2 diabetes. People with type 2 diabetes will say, well, you know what? My problem is blood sugar. I've got a high blood sugar, and that's dangerous. And that's true. But why do we have a high blood sugar? The sugar they're talking about is glucose. The glucose comes from things you eat. It comes from beans and fruits and vegetables and starchy foods. They contribute glucose, which the cell is very glad to have. Here's glucose. It goes through these little channels, and once it gets into the cell, the cell uses it as its favorite fuel. Just as your car burns gasoline, your muscle cells really want to burn glucose. When a person is going to run a marathon, they know to get to the end, they need a lot of glucose inside their cell. So in the days leading up to it, they're eating bread and spaghetti and starchy foods to get the glucose into their cell. It's stored in a form called glycogen. Okay. However, there's a hitch here. Glucose can't get into the cell on its own. It needs a key. Anybody know what that key is called? It's called insulin. The insulin is made in your pancreas. It goes in the blood and it gets onto the surface of the cell. Here are these little insulin molecules. Just like a key in a lock, it opens the door to let the glucose inside. But what if one day I come home from work and I take the key out of my pocket and I put it in my front door and I notice that my, my door's not opening and I look inside my lock. While I was gone, somebody put gum in my lock. Well, what's that about? Well, you don't have gum in your cells, but what do we have in your cells? We've got fat, and that fat, that intramyocellular lipid, as it builds up, it interferes with this signaling process, just like gum in a lock. So you've got insulin. You've got an insulin receptor. That's no problem there, but it cannot get that signaling to work. It breaks down because of all the fat inside the cell. The glucose can't get inside the cell. The doctor says, you've got diabetes. And then what do they tell you to do? Stop eating bread, stop eating pasta, stop eating things that contribute blood glucose. And then, well, I'm sorry, that's not quite enough. So why don't you take a medicine called metformin? And let me add another one to it. And maybe another one. And, well, now is the time for injections, and they're really not very painful. And as time goes on, you discover you are losing this battle. And then we have talks about complications for your eyes, for your kidneys, for your legs. The cause of type 2 diabetes is insulin resistance that occurs because of this buildup of fat inside the cell. The answer to diabetes is to get the fat out. And we've got to get it off our plate. This is not a zero-fat diet. There are traces of fats in, in everything that you eat. But we're getting rid of the excess that's poisoning the cell. Okay. This is Geico. I'd like to talk to you about your car insurance. <laughs> when I look out my office window, that's what I see. Geico is a couple blocks away from, from, from our office. Uh, we're over on Wisconsin Avenue. And there are 2,500 people working in that building. And whenever any one of them starts a cholesterol-lowering drug or a medicine for blood pressure or if they need a surgical procedure, who pays for it? Well, Geico pays for it. And wouldn't it be a great thing if everybody who worked there were vegan? Because they'd have less diabetes and less health problems, and everybody would save a lot of money. So we, back in 2007, we got to talking with Geico, and we decided to do two things. The first was, in the cafeteria, they were serving bacon and eggs for breakfast. We said, fine, keep, keep serving that, but let's have an oatmeal bar. And for lunch, they've got cheeseburgers. Keep serving that, but how about veggie burgers? How about portobello sandwiches? How about a salad bar? And so they instituted these things. And the other thing was, anybody who decided they wanted to try a vegan diet was allowed once a week at lunchtime 
to have a discussion group where everybody would come in and we'd do cooking classes. Or we'd talk about how our diet was going, we would demonstrate new products. I've never tasted soy milk, well now's your chance. We got, everybody got a chance to, to see what it was like. And so from July through December of 2007, we did our first study. Um, in the Washington DC office over there on um, Willard Avenue, uh, we had a group of individuals say, I wanna try this vegan diet. And in Fredericksburg, Virginia, at a separate Geico facility, they said, we'll be your control group, no changes here, but at both places, we checked their weight and their cholesterol. And if they had diabetes, we checked their, their bloods as well. And I have to say, there were a few missteps along the way. <laughs> what can you say? This is a new thing for everybody. Anyway, as time went on, what we found is that the people in Fredericksburg, Virginia did not lose any weight, but the people here did lose weight. Now, the biggest weight loss we saw was 46 pounds from July through December, but some people left the study and they didn't lose anything. But the average was about 11 pounds. And then uh, when we looked at their waist circumference, they were getting a little bit thinner. And I wanna show you Hillary and Bruce because when the study was getting started, I was really troubled by Hillary and Bruce. They came every single week to the discussion group, but they sat in the back. And instead of paying attention, they just kept talking. Uh, they were talking all the time, and no matter how good the cooking demonstrations were, or no matter how riveting the discussion, they just kept chattering and looking in each other's eyes, and I thought, what, why are you even here? But you know what? You can misjudge people, and I misjudged them. They, 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 they were talking a lot, but what they were talking about was, what are we gonna pick up on the way home that fits with this diet? How are we gonna convince your parents to go vegan too? How are we gonna get through Thanksgiving and still follow this? They were really into it, and a year later, they sent me this picture. And they sent me this, they, he, he's lost 100 pounds, she's lost 85 pounds. They sent me this because they wanted to show me something. Bruce told me that, he said, when I was really heavy, I didn't feel like exercising because first of all, it hurts to exercise. If you're carrying 100 pounds extra, it hurts. But the other thing is, he said, I don't feel like running down the road and have everybody see me jiggling everywhere. Now, he said it with a smile, but I know that he really meant this. And in fact, anybody who's ever been on a diet, you know that at first it starts out okay, then you start getting stuck. And then as, as the weight starts coming back and you're having trouble, you'll find yourself saying, you know, other people seem to succeed at this. I think there's something wrong with, I, I, I can't make this work. There, there's something wrong with my willpower or maybe I'm not planning it out right or whatever. And then you, you give up. You try another diet. And at first you succeed, but then it all stalls. And then you're, you're, you're having more and more trouble and you're having more temptation than you should. And you think, I think there is something wrong with me. I don't have the backbone that I should have. I don't have the capability. Maybe I'm not planning. There's really something wrong with me that more than other people. And the more times we repeat this process, the more we learn, not only am I condemned to being in a body that doesn't feel right, but there is something psychologically wrong with me. And it bleeds over into every other aspect of our life. We feel that I'm just not acceptable, I just can't do things. And what Bruce told me is, wait a minute, when you come to realize that all of that is a lie, when you come to realize there is not one thing wrong with you. There is nothing wrong with you. Well, there's something wrong with these diets that say, starve it off for the rest of your life, go hungry. When you know by Wednesday you're ready to eat the sofa, your body is designed to say you must eat. When you set those lies aside and you just put in your body the foods it was really looking for, your body takes it from there. And then not only do you slim down, not, not only does your, your health start to return, but you start to unlearn these lies that we've learned about ourselves. We learn, wait a minute, I can do things. And with the help of my friends and my family and the people that I'm, that I'm with, I can do things. I can change the way I eat. I can regain my health. I, and, and, and you can do other aspects of life as well. I can do okay at my job. I can succeed. We unlearn those lies and our body regains its health. So this is the power plate. And in 2009, we sent this to the Department of Agriculture because we said, you know, the pyramid is a nice shape, but nobody eats off a pyramid. They eat off a plate. So let's make it more literal and say, these are the things that we should really eat. And did you see what came out earlier this year? The Department of Agriculture, 
So I'm not taking any credit for this, but I thought that's an improvement. Um, okay, so when a person is making a diet change, we tend to think, okay, I want to make sure I'm getting all the nutrients that I need, and that's important. But the first one is protein. You're going to get plenty of protein, even without any special combinations. You don't need special protein powders. And the reason I say that is beans have protein, grains have protein. Broccoli doesn't want to brag, but it's 30% protein. You know, it, it, a meat eater, where's the meat eater get protein from? From meat, right? Well, if that meat came from a cow, that cow is a vegan. Okay? You're going to get plenty of protein. You don't have to specially combine things. You're going to do fine. Now, calcium is a real issue, but it's such a simple one. We're not drinking milk, but, but wait a minute. The milk came from the cow. The cow's a vegan. Where's the cow getting calcium? From plants also. So the greens and the beans, greens, beans, greens, kale, collards, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, calcium rich. One exception, spinach. Spinach has calcium, but spinach is a very selfish vegetable. It's the, the calcium is not very well absorbed. Greens loaded with highly absorbable calcium. Beans also. Let me say a word of praise for beans. Our grandparents knew about beans, but somehow we've kind of forgotten about them. They've got lots of protein. They've got iron. They have calcium. They have traces of omega-3. They have soluble fiber, insoluble fiber. They don't have a good lobby group, but beans have very good nutrition. So greens, beans, lots of calcium. Now, vitamin B12 is something you need for healthy nerves and healthy blood. And B12 is not made by animals or plants. It's actually made by bacteria. And the theory is that before modern hygiene, the traces of bacteria on, in the soil, on plants, on our fingers, and our mouths might have produced the tiny traces we need. Let me tell you, that is a totally unreliable source, at least today. So you can get B12 in fortified foods, like fortified cereals, fortified soy milk, or just any supplement. And when I say a supplement, I mean every multiple vitamin you ever took has all the B12 you'll ever need. So it's, it's really easy to get, but you want to make sure you don't miss it. Um, oh, by the way, uh, the government now says that everybody, no matter what your diet is, should be taking B12 if you're over 50. Um, the reason they say that is that a lot of people don't absorb it from foods very well. B12, in, if there's, there's B12 in meat, a little bit of it because in the cow's gut are bacteria that make the B12. So some of it gets into the meat. You have those same bacteria in your digestive tract, but your absorption is low. Uh, very, I mean, it's, it's essentially zero um, from that source. So if a person is on acid-blocking drugs or they're on metformin or as time goes on, they just don't absorb it very well from food. So the government says, take a supplement, and I think that everybody should. Vegans really have to, but everybody really should. And, and not neglect it, okay? Um, so by now you might be saying, well, Dr. Barnard, I'll believe you. I'm sure this is a healthy way to go. But I'm not quite sure how I would actually do it. How, how do I get from where I am now to what you're suggesting? And is my family going to make me eat in the garage? And how will this work? Well, I have two ways, two steps that I use for introducing this. And I've never seen anybody who can't do these two steps. The first step is don't change your diet yet. Just take a week and try to think what you would like that actually happens to have no animal products in it and that would keep oils low. So I take a piece of paper and I write breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack. And the first week my job is to just fill that out. So I'll think of breakfasts that I like, whether it's oatmeal or pancakes or whatever, and try them out. We've got lots of recipes and the idea is just to see what I like. And then once I know, then on to lunch maybe or dinner. Uh, maybe I'll have a spaghetti with a marinara sauce, a bean burrito, whatever it is. Um, and if I go Italian, all right, where I'm invited out to dinner, well, yes, they've got salads and they've got pasta fagiol and lentil soup, and they'll top it on my spaghetti with various kinds of, of plant-based toppings. No problem there. Could I go vegan at a Mexican place? Sure. Easy. They've got bean burritos and veggie fajitas and beans and rice. At Chinese places, very easy, all kinds of choices. Extra points for Japanese because they don't use very much oil. Um, so the idea is just to figure out what you like. Now, if you're eating at a fast food place, is there anything there? Well, you go to Subway and you just say, leave off the cheese, leave, leave off the meat. 
give me the lettuce, the tomato, the olives, the pickles, the hot peppers, all the, whatever it is you want, and they'll drizzle it with a, a little vinegar. They'll toast it for you. Um, or if you're at Taco Bell, instead of the meat taco, have the bean burrito, hold the cheese. No, this isn't the pinnacle of culinary art. But if that's where you are, those are the choices that you're going to make. So once you know what you like, then step two is to take it for a three-week test drive. All right. For 21 days, I'm going to do all vegan all the time, and I'm making no promises for day 22. Fair enough. At the end of that time, two things will have happened. The first is you're healthier. You're slimming down. If you've got diabetes, it's improving. If you have high blood pressure, it's improving. Your energy's getting better. Your digestion's better. But the second thing is your tastes are changing. You're not just physically healthier. You, your tastes are changing. Now, you may not believe me. How many of you ever switched from whole milk to non-fat milk or skim milk? Let me see your hands. Okay, when you did, what was, this, what was the low-fat milk like at first? How did it taste? Watery? Doesn't even look right, sort of blue. Well, how many, how many of you eventually got used to it? Okay, then did you ever go back and taste whole milk again? What's that like? It's too thick, right? It's, it's cream, it's, like, it's almost like paint. Well, wait a minute, your whole life it was fine, but when you got away from it, your taste buds said, okay, we're lowering fat, and the fat expectation is turned down and if you go back to it, you don't like it anymore. You, you know, you're, you're not even tempted. So if you go on a totally vegan diet the first week, it will seem light. You're going to say to yourself, oh, do I have to acquire a taste for folk music now? Oh, my goodness. Maybe I have to start wearing tie-dyed shirts. I'm not sure. Anyway, the second week, it starts making sense. And by about week three, you're totally there. And you've found all kinds of new products, new restaurants, new books. You're seeing things in a completely different way. And if you go back and have a double bacon cheeseburger, you discover it's not the joyful experience you remember. You are so far past that. So the third thing is something I learned from my mother. And it's transition foods. My mother, in, in Fargo, my mother living with my father and their five kids, my mom had a high cholesterol level. And when I got out of medical school, I realized how serious this was. And I was telling my mother, you really ought to change your diet. Well, I don't know. Anyway, as time went on, she paid no attention to me whatsoever. And I was worried, because she could have a heart attack, she could have a stroke, paying no attention. And by the way, I finally figured out why my mother was ignoring me. I am my mother's third-born child. Are any of you third-borns in this audience? Your parents ever pay any attention to anything that you ever did? No. Uh, no, they don't, and you see the tragedy of it every time you open the family photo album because there are a lot of pages of number one, and there's a few pages of number two, but to find you, you've got to look in the index, you know? <laughs> it's not that your parents don't love you. It's just they know what a dribbling toddler is like by the time they got to you. They're not going to pay any attention to anything you say, especially about medical issues. So you can look your mother in the eye and say, Mom, You've got hypercholesterolemia. You've got atherosclerosis. She thinks it's cute, you know, big words, but she's not paying any attention. So finally, she sits down with her own physician. And her doctor says, Mrs. Barnard, you've got a high cholesterol level. We need to deal with this. I'm going to write you a prescription. The prescription is Lipitor. I want you to take it every day. This will control your cholesterol. And she says, OK, fine, I'll, I'll take it. But how long do I have to take it for? She says, I don't think you understand. I want you to take this medicine every day Forever. I mean, you need to take this to control your cholesterol. She says, what? What kind of medicine is that? I've got to take it forever for it to work? She goes home. She's, she picks up a book that I wrote called Food for Life. Neil told me, if I make these recipes, my cholesterol level ought to fall. My mother does it. My mom starts a vegan diet, and she does it for seven weeks. She goes back to the doctor. He, does, he draws a blood sample, sends it to the lab. And the lab slip comes out, and he walks into the exam room. He looks at my mother. And he looks at the lab slip. And he looks at my mother and he says, we've got a problem here. Um, I need you to come back next week. There's something wrong with the laboratory. We'll, 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 we'll get it sorted out. Her cholesterol had dropped 70 or 80 points in this, in this short period of time. He thought this was physically impossible. And he wanted her to come back and they'd get the machinery all worked out. She says, well, wait a minute. If that's real, do I need medicine? He said, no, that's what I'm explaining. This could be like a 16-year-old kid's cholesterol level. It's obviously not yours. So come back next week. We'll sort it all out. We'll get you started with your medications. Everything's going to be fine. 
She says, I see. Thank you. Goodbye. My mother goes home, picks up the phone, calls me up, and says, Neil, why didn't you tell me about this before? <laughs> so, anyhow, the light bulb has gone off in my mother's head. This diet saves you from medication. And everybody in the world ought to be on this diet, starting with my father. So she's decided that my dad is going to be her first vegan. And my dad grew up in a cattle ranch. And he's not about to do this lefty, veg and political diet thing. However, like all men born in 1925, my father has no idea where the kitchen is. My father has been sitting at the same table for all these years, and when he's hungry, the food just comes. <laughs> and when he's done, the plates, they go. And you stick around three or four more hours, it all starts again. And my mother takes full advantage of that. My mother is the one who does the shopping, the food preparation, the cleanup, everything. So she goes to the store. She gets a good bread and some romaine lettuce, some Italian tomatoes, and she slices it up thin, makes them a sandwich. She puts on Dijon mustard, which in Fargo is really a cool thing. And so then she'll get these things that are like ham or turkey or, or bologna, but, but they're the vegetarian versions. They're, made, they're not really ham or turkey. They're made of soy or, or wheat gluten or something. She'll make my dad a bologna sandwich that has no bologna in it. And he's, he's been happily eating these things. She'll make him a hot dog, and he'll eat it. It's a, it's a not dog. And <laughs> you'd think he might have figured out what's going on, but you know what? I ended up with two vegetarian parents, and only one of them actually knows it. So <laughs> I call these, these are transition foods. A transition food is something that looks like meat but really isn't. You don't need them. They're totally optional, but there are times when they're handy like for a real solid meat eater, or, or maybe it's birthday and the n other neighbor kids are coming over, don't make them lentil loaf. They're going to beat your kid up. Instead, <laughs> you should serve them like veggie hot dogs. They'll think, oh, that's a really cool political statement you're making. So those, I call them transition foods, and they've got everything nowadays. They've got soy milk, soy yogurt, soy ice cream. They're going to make soy snow tires one of these days. It's amazing what they can do. So just try, you don't need them, but, but they're there. Okay. Uh, we have some resources. Um, some of you may be members of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. If you are, I'm very grateful to you. Um, if you're not, go to our website, pcrm.org. We have lots of books, um, and each one is designed to be a tool to help people to, ch to solve a problem. Um, and some of you, have any of you tried our Kickstart program? It's an online program. It's fun. Um, what we do is the Kickstart, uh, the next one is going to be the beginning of January. We're just finishing one now. And what it is, you go to the website, you put in your email address, doesn't cost you anything. You put in your email, and then five days before, before we begin, I send you an email that says, here's some menus and recipes you might want to try. Then four days before, I'm going to send you another email that will say, why don't you try some cooking techniques, and I'll embed a little video in there for you to look at. Then three days before, I'm going to start saying, I'll send you another email that says, why not get rid of the contraband? All the things you don't want to be tempted with, let's get rid of that. And that, So every day I'm getting you ready. Then on the first day of the 21-day kickstart, what we're going to do is you're going to get an email from Alicia Silverstone, who says, when I'm in Hollywood and I need to be slim and healthy, here's how I eat. Or Bob Harper from The Biggest Loser. We have athletes, celebrities, doctors who are our celebrity coaches. And every day you get an email from one with menus, recipes, cooking videos, all, everything that you're going to need, and at any given time, we have 20 or 30,000 people doing it. They talk to each other. So you might say, what am I going to have at Thanksgiving? You put that on the message board, and inside of 45 minutes, you've got 30 people telling you, here's my suggestion, here's my suggestion, here's my suggestion. So it's good information, but it's also a way to be part of a, of a community that's doing this together. We all have challenges, we all have successes, we share it, we talk. And it makes it really easy, it makes it really fun. We've had almost 200,000 people do this. And in November, we're doing Kickstart India. And in March, we're doing Kickstart China in Mandarin. And the reason we're doing that is China and India are the two biggest countries in the world, and both of them are losing touch with the plant-based diets that have been traditional. And Pizza Hut is coming in, and a lot of things are invading from the West. And what we need to do is a little bit of an Easternization of the diet, if you don't mind my putting it that way, and remembering some things that were age-old wisdom that have been a little bit forgotten. So Kickstart India begins November, Kickstart China begins in uh, March, and then 
the Spanish language version begins the end of 2012. The last thing I just want to say is I do want us to be healthy f for ourselves. But there's something that's more important than that. And that's the next generation. Right now, if we look at childhood obesity, it's worse than it's ever been. been. The, the number of kids who are heavy is higher than it's ever been. But that's just one thing. When, when a child grows up, they're at higher risk for diabetes. They're at higher risk for postmenopausal breast cancer, higher risk for, for heart disease. The next generation of kids, you've heard it said, they're not going to live as long as their parents did. They're going to be in the worst shape of any generation in the history of this country. Now, we can, we can turn that around. And it starts with taking a week, trying out healthier choices, doing a three-week test drive, and then doing the most important thing of all, not keeping it a secret. Talk to other people. You can talk to your skeptical physician who says, how did you actually get your cholesterol down? How did you improve your diabetes? We can talk to schools, which right now are using the school lunch program as a dumping ground for agricultural commodities. We can talk to other people who need some help. And if we spread this word, instead of every single city and town worrying about how are we going to pay for health care costs, instead we can think about how to enrich this world that we live in with things that matter much more. And we can do that by working together to take this simple power of three, putting it to work for ourselves and our communities, we can change the health of this country. Thank you very much.